Welcome to this edition of the Boone of Wireless podcast, coming to you, as always, high above the streets of northern New Jersey at ANJ Media. Yes, New Jersey, where we have certain words for things that no other state has. Like, for example, a ripper is a deep-fried hot dog originated from Rutt's Hut right here in Clifton. Andrew, have you been to Rutt's Hut? No. No, I have not, John. Okay, try it. If you live in northern New Jersey, you eat a sub, and in southern New Jersey, it's a hoagie, a hero, or a grinder. We don't go to the beach. We go down the shore, and we have shoobies. That's people that go down the shore with their grinder or sub in a shoebox and eat it on the beach. Shoobies. Okay. Our guest on the program today is a wireless industry veteran of nearly 40 years. His experience includes management roles with regional, national, and international wireless carriers. In addition, he's held senior executive roles with an award-winning regional wireless retailer, an accessory manufacturer, and provided consulting services to numerous companies in a variety of wireless industry segments. He is the co-founder of Capital Growth Partners, a business advisory firm that focuses on helping clients in a wide variety of technology segments. Bob LaFon is a frequent keynote speaker, panel moderator, or panelist at industry trade shows and conferences worldwide. He is also the co-founder of the wildly successful Mobile Disrupt Conference, which supports the secondary phone market and supporting services. And we're going to speak a lot about that today. So welcome to the broadcast from Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania, Mr. Bob LaFont. Bob, it is great to see you again. John, thank you so much for having me. Hey, by the way, uh, New Jersey is not the only place that has its own vernacular. In Western Pennsylvania, we have what we call Pittsburghese. Okay. Uh, for example, you've heard the phrase y'all, like or y'all going to the beach, y'all going on vacation. We have yins, Y I N yins. Yins. Went to uh, college with a lot of Pittsburgh folks, and it was yins. And I found out uh, all about Iron City beer as well. So it's, <laughs> it's good stuff. Hey, uh, what is that on your desk behind you, under the under the lamp? Oh, <laughs> uh, that that's uh, that was a Christmas present from my wife um, a few years can ago. We, can uh, we see it? I, it and sure. Show it to the uh, sure, yeah. the worldwide. Yes, she, oh my goodness! Yes, that's the Bob. The Bob. Well, the Bob. Please meet the Boone. All right. So there you go. All right. So okay, the Boone's gonna. We should just let the two, we should let the two of these have a conversation. It, it might be more. It would probably be more interesting. So okay. So Bob, tell us a little bit about Capital Growth Partners. You refer to yourselves as a, a business advisory firm. What's the difference between a business advisory? and a business consulting company? Well, traditionally, consulting firms are very data-driven. They'll come into an organization, they'll interview different staff members, they'll look at a variety of, of different reports and aspects of the business, compile that data, bring that data back to the company, uh, maybe make some general recommendations, but then leave you to do the execution. We're not big fans of that model, and we've seen how people have responded in recent years to consulting firms. So we look at it and said, you know, we, we want to be hands on. We want to work shoulder to shoulder with the clients. So we decided to coin the phrase business advisory firm rather than consulting firm, because in our model, we don't just deliver data. We deliver solutions. For example, with the RLA conference uh, about a month ago, someone I knew casually approached me about having us do a go-to-market strategy for him. And I said, you just want us to design and, and give you the go-to-market strategy? He said, yes. I said, that's really not a good fit for us. He said, well, why? It says on your website that that's something you do. I said, but the other part of that is the execution. Here's, here's the problem with that. If we develop the GTM, we give it to you, you take it out and execute on it and it fails, what was the problem with the strategy or the execution of the strategy, right? And then you tell people that you paid us X number of dollars for a go-to-market strategy that didn't work. So, you know, in our instance, we're going to work shoulder to shoulder with you on the implementation of that strategy, whether it's business development, organizational development, go-to-market strategy, exit planning, capital raise, what have you. You're going to feel like we're part of your organization because we're going to execute on all of this with you. So we are a very hands-on group who wants to work with the client to ensure successful outcomes. Well, if I hired you, would you recommend that I change my company's name from Atrium Unlimited Consulting to Atrium Unlimited Advisory Group? Or <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. It really depends. Look, if, if what you have is working for you, that's what's most important. Right, right. Okay. Um, it's more a matter of there's a certain, we feel 
our opinions. And it's not something we've researched. We simply feel that there's a bit of a stigma associated with the term consulting. So to try and not be put into that box, we chose to drop the word consulting and use the word advisor. I will have to pay you a royalty if I make that change. Okay. Uh, I'll send you a bill. Thank you. Uh, you have a, a methodology called RISE, R-I-S-E. Uh, it's a method and approach for helping businesses with their needs. It's uh, review, strategize, implement, review. And it's very prevalent on your company's website. Give us an example of where you put RISE into place and what were the results? Well, to give an example, we will not take on an engagement until we can go spend two to three days on site with a client doing a really deep dive to understand every facet of their business. Mm -hmm. We get a non-disclosure in place. They have to agree to bringing us on site. We aren't contracted with them at that point to actually engage. We're just trying to understand the problems and determine if we can bring the solutions. If we don't feel that we're the right team or we don't feel that this client may be as coachable and um, moldable as we need them to be, then we may step away and say, we don't think we can help you, but here's some basic recommendations that you can start with yourself or there are other people we may choose to recommend. So even someone such as yourself could be, you know, we could contact and say, we think that you might be better off to have a conversation with John or another firm. Uh, rather than taking on an engagement we don't feel we can succeed with. So a lot of it's really about qualification of the opportunity and understanding what the real needs are, because oftentimes people have a perception of what they need, but they don't have the objectivity to know what they truly need. So it's a process of discovery. Back in the day when, you know, uh, we were all a little bit younger and we had consultants come in on, on a corporate level. And uh, from what I remember is that, employees were and again it was a different time in the workplace uh, employees were reluctant to tell senior management what they thought or what was issues that they wanted to have corrected make it a better workplace culture etc so consultants would come in and the employees would open up their hearts to these people and tell them everything which i don't think they realized that that was going up the ladder to the senior management and whatever the repercussions were they were um, how how do you uh, approach digging out the uh, or uncovering i should say the uh the root cause of some of the things that they're trying to get uh, resolved why they would hire capital growth partners a lot of it has to do with the nature of the questions because that two or three day on site is strictly with senior leadership uh, of that organization and we're going to ask them a variety of different questions. Some of them are bottom line questions. Let's look at top line, let's look at bottom line. Let's work, let's look at what's profitable, what's not as profitable. Let's understand your strategies. Let's understand your target markets. Are you, you know, um, are you focused on certain verticals where you're trying to be successful? How are you going to market? Excuse me, things of that nature. And then, then a lot of it is just a more of a social conversation just trying to get an understanding of their vision um, for the organization, why they started it, where they felt that they hit certain roadblocks that they haven't been able to push past. Especially when you're working with founder-led companies, you find a lot of commonality um, in where those roadblocks exist. And it's usually in an area where they simply lack experience. And not a criticism, it's just simply a matter of they've run into problems that they've never seen before so they don't have that baseline of knowledge or information to overcome those problems. So, like I said, a lot of it is, is a matter of discovery, looking at all the data, all the relative pain points, uh, a lot of questions and answers and discussions, uh, both philosophical and strategic, to understand where they've come from, where they're trying to go, what the roadblocks are, and then determining from there if we believe we can help. So. That first phase is, is not engaging with the employees yet. That does come later, and we do, do go into it understanding that we're gonna get a little different perspective once we start yeah. to talk to staff. Right, right. And when you go there for two or three days on site in this, you know, as you and I have spoken previously, there's just not enough time in the day to get everything done. Are they giving you right. two and a half, three days of their undivided attentions? You know, you'll have breaks, I'm sure, but phones are off, no email, are you really, setting the rules that look we're coming in here and we need you focused on us helping you you get that support yeah we really do okay. now we understand they still have a business to operate when we're coming on site so if we need to take some breaks we'll take that we're going to be 
as flexible and accommodating as we can, but they know that we're coming in with the mission of trying to uncover what's really, what are the underlying issues that need to be addressed. And, and sometimes it's even simple things. For example, we just finished up an engagement where we're talking with the principals of the firm and their business is very, it's plagued by sameness, I would say, in terms of what they do is pretty much the same thing that all their competitors do. So I asked the question, I said, okay, let's role play for a moment. I'm talking to you as a prospective customer and I say, why your organization? Why would I do business with you as opposed to your competition? They gave me blank stares. Then they looked at each other, gave blank stares. Then they looked back at me and they were really struggling to give an answer. And I said, okay, we're gonna start with that. The fact that you can't identify, I said, now, I did establish some ground rules. I told them that they couldn't use things like price point or customer service because those are impossible to prove. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I've said many times uh, in my writings uh, that I do every other week for one of our trade magazines and as well as on this uh, podcast that uh, we turn down uh, probably more clients than we accept. I, I think you're probably, yeah, uh, because they just don't know. And you talk about why would I come to you um, as, a, as a customer. I talk about why would somebody switch their current wireless provider to come to you, your MVNO, um, what's your differentiator? So it seems like we're both going down the same path. Um, during COVID, um, how did you get over the hurdle of not going somewhere for two to three days on site, or maybe you did, maybe you took the proper precautions. Did that affect your business? I know that in the wireless business during COVID, uh, we saw across the board, incredible uh, increases in revenue, in customer subscribers, in data usage, in um, activations on hotspots, because all of a sudden mom and dad and two or three kids were all now working from home. And we had an incredible growth uh, and it was done remotely. What did the, the pandemic do for your business as far as getting in front of people? Well, it, it caused us to have to do more of that work in this fashion, remote, mm -hmm. virtual, where we were able to travel. We did do some travel um, and had those meetings face to face. Um, you know, as you said, it, it really varied from city to city and state to state as to how areas were handling people coming on site, if they were requiring you to have your temperature taken, wear masks, things of that nature. So, you know, there was a lot of variation to that. Um, but we did probably more work than, than I've ever done in my entire career virtually. And I don't think it was quite as effective because there's a different, different dynamic when you're face to face with someone. You know, for example, the way my office is set up, I have this screen and the screen to my left. And so it's it's possible that I can sometimes be distracted because I can look over here and see something pop up on that screen and turn my attention to this. When you're in person with someone, it tends to be a little bit more focused and less distracting. So, um, I, you know, it was fraught with challenges, but we made it work. The other thing at that point was our firm was considerably smaller because I had just left employment with another company. Um, joined a good friend of mine who most of his staff had really aged out and it was just he and I initially then I brought in another friend uh, Tony Andrews who's now one of my business partners so in those early stages we were just working with a smaller number of clients and a lot of what we were focused on wasn't business turnaround so much as they were just stuck because if they were in a business where they needed to acquire assets for example and people people weren't focused on disposing of these used IT assets or used mobile devices or things of that nature. They were kind of stuck on what do we do to generate revenue right now? So you know, a lot of that was how could we help them shift in a different direction, continue to generate revenue, keep their people employed and survive that period of time. So, uh, you know, it was definitely fraught with challenges, as I said, but we stuck to the script. You know, we have a very in-depth discovery process. We stayed true to it. Uh, and, you know, we did what we had to do to make it work. Okay. Uh, now let's pivot over to what Capital Growth Partners is doing specifically in different verticals, such as AI, artificial intelligence, uh, software as a service, robotics, telecom, network solutions, packaging, data analytics, et cetera. How are you advising uh, customers and assisting with raising capital? Uh, you mentioned you were engaged with some telecom clients, but not yet. 
within their traditional wireless companies, as our audience might recognize. What type of companies are these? I don't know if you can name names or not. If not, that's okay. But what, what type of companies are you engaging with? Uh, I'd rather not name names without asking clients permission beforehand, okay. of course, because these are these are active clients. Yeah. But I can certainly give you examples of the different industry segments we're serving and why. Okay. A lot of it is vertically based. We're trying to play to our strengths because our, our team is anywhere from 52 years old to 70 years old and, and somewhere in between. So we all have certain verticals where we have a lot of history. And that's where a lot of our clients come from are those relationships. So some of our staff have substantial experience in, uh, say, SaaS solutions, which is just software as, a, software as a solution. Now, of course, that has broad application in terms of what it can be doing. But one client, for example, uh, uses AI, machine learning, and SaaS solutions to process used mobile devices. So their AI will look at grading standards for used mobile devices, and through that and machine learning, come up with a consistent grading standard that the robotics can then perform at a level that people never can because grading tends to be subjective because it's visual. Uh, in, in large part is visual, not just diagnostic, but looking at a device and deciding this is A, this is B, this is C and so on. So we have, we have clients in that's that part of the business. Uh, we have other clients that are uh, providing SaaS based solutions that are more business oriented in terms of providing things like um, CRM integration um, and integration into billing systems and getting all of those different platforms to talk to one another because a common problem in business today is people have a variety of different software solutions that do not communicate, they're not integrated. So you have to log in and out of multiple systems. So we have a client, for example, that's solving a lot of that by giving one platform that operates uh, and provides all those different services with just one subscription, if you will. Um, so, you know, it, it just really depends. We have other clients that are in the business of doing repair and refurbishment of used devices. Uh, we have another client that's uh, from Finland that um, provides a, an interesting solution that integrates into a billing system, for example, with a carrier. It takes a look at the B2B side of things and identifies what services those clients are using and more importantly, what services they're not using, puts that data together in an intelligent fashion that informs strategy so that that company can then go back and try and farm more business out of those B2B customers and maximize revenue on those opportunities. Because in a mature marketplace, since say wireless, for example, a space you're familiar, more than familiar with, the real growth opportunities come from the current client base. When you have millions of subscribers, your fastest path to increasing your revenue is your own client base, not new acquisitions. Right. Right. So this tool helps them to find ways to farm more revenue out of that existing client base than trying to bring on new subscribers and get growth that fashion. Well, it's an old adage in the, the wireless business that uh, the carrier spends four to $500 acquiring a customer, but very little in retaining them. And with right. the, uh, onslaught right now and the growth explosive growth of well two things um the mvno world um which has now become much easier and economically to get into as i said uh many times still a big commitment still, still a financial you know uh drain until you start making revenue but the other explosion and we talked about it with uh, seth henna uh, a couple weeks ago on the broadcast the explosion of uh call it what you will, uh, refurbished phones, previously owned, certified, et cetera, et cetera. I want to make it clear that you are not in the handset business, correct? That's correct. You're providing, are you providing diagnostics? Are you providing uh, ways to move uh, a previously owned handset through the supply chain? What exactly is uh, your role with uh, previously owned devices? We don't buy, we don't sell, we don't trade, we don't touch equipment. That's not our role. As advisors, we're looking strictly at business problems. So, for example, our client that provides AI, machine learning, and robotics, we're dealing with business development and go-to-market strategies for them. They're brilliant engineers, and we believe they have the best, best technology in the space to process those used mobile devices, help extract additional value out of them, so that people who are in the business of selling those phones can get more value out of them. So uh, in our instance, we developed the, the go-to-market strategy and work on the business development side with their team to help bring more customers 
generate revenues, and grow that business utilizing their technology. That's a very, very good segue into uh, what's coming up uh, for you in, in a month or two, two months, three months. Let's talk about Mobile Disrupt. It's a conference that you launched in 2022. Uh, for our listeners and viewers out there, uh, you're stating that Mobile Disrupt uh, this year will attract over 1,000 people focusing on the mobility sector and associated verticals. Uh, everything from what, mobile device management, refurbishing and repair, wholesale distribution, IoT, enterprise mobility, what else, a whole host of other to topics. Um, so that show's coming up. We're going to talk about it. It's in Las Vegas. And um, why did you create Mobile Disrupt? What was, I, I ask a lot of my guests, what was that lightning bolt or shiny moment? You said, oh, I'm going to create a trade show. Uh, several years ago, I took on my first client who was in the used phone space. And, and at that time, there wasn't really a name for that space. It was growing, but there wasn't a phrase for it. And as I was going to different shows, I was noticing that there was no real focus on the used space. There was nothing that was catering to that space, but it was a rapidly growing segment. So I thought, you know, it would really be good if we could develop a show that catered to that, that entire ecosphere, everybody who plays in that space and supports that space. But I'd never done a show before. So I'd attended a few ITAT summits, liked their format a lot, approached the promoter of that event and said, I want to do a conference that focuses on the used mobile device space. It's a very rapidly growing segment of wireless. I think it deserves its own conference and its own support system, but the bigger Bigger shows that are out there tend to focus on the carriers, the big insurance companies, the OEMs, et cetera, which I understand. So it's not a criticism. It's just those are the big companies with deep pockets. So that's who they support. I said, but I've never done a show before. He said, well, he said, being in the ITAT space, dealing with I used IT assets, he said, a lot of our participants don't understand mobile, but they'd like to because they get phones sent to them along with those used IT assets. He said, but I don't know mobile. He said, so yeah, I'd love to do it with you. So we formed a partnership, uh, started working on it. We announced it actually in, in August of 2021 uh, put by putting out a little teaser announcement and then started working from there and officially launched our first event in June of 2022 at the Bellagio, where we had about 600 organizations who attended. Most were companies that buy, repair, and sell used phones at that time. Since then, the show has grown to the larger ecosphere where we have companies that provide managed mobility services where they will acquire the, the asset, download certain applications, deploy it, provide help desk support for it, repair it, and sell it at end of life for their enterprise customers. We have more and more companies that are providing um, say custom packaging solutions because the growth in that space of the used devices is tremendous. There's also the resale groups that sell those used devices. There are massive marketplaces that have been collecting tens of millions of dollars in funding to sell used devices um, because customers are keeping their old phones longer. I mean, right now we're at about 36 months that people are keeping their phones, uh, which is longer than ever. But also with the price of phones, since they're no longer subsidized, people are sometimes looking to the used market to upgrade one or two generations newer. So we're trying to support that entire ecosphere uh, with this conference. And we've grown from 600 attendees to 900 attendees. We're trending 1,500 wow. for this year's event. I stand corrected. Wow, wow, 1,500. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we've already doubled the size of our total exhibitors last year from 60 to 120 and we still have three months to go right. so there's actually a possibility we may sell out the space that we have at the bellagio this year which we didn't even anticipate so that's great uh, we're working furiously to make sure we can accommodate everybody these uh exhibitors or wholesalers <clears throat> when you're dealing in the uh the used phone market um is it price driven um when you're moving tens of thousands of handsets, is it price driven? Is it quality driven? Is it what's, what, again, the differentiator? There's, I don't know, dozens of companies that are doing the same thing. What what are some of the differentiators that I would buy from uh, this firm versus this firm? Well, there's two different segments. There's the wholesale side that's dealing with large volumes. So you have companies that will get onto auction sites, say, with a carrier or insurance company and buy thousands of devices at one time. They call it a lot, L-O-T. Right. 
So they'll buy that lot of, of thousands of devices, bring them in, test them, wipe the data, do cosmetic grading, and then resell them to markets all over the world. Most of the devices get sold back to the insurance companies here in the U.S. so that if someone files a claim, they can send them a replacement device. But what can't be sold here are then sold into international markets because our old technology is still state-of-the-art somewhere in the world. For example, the best place to sell an iPhone 8 right now is probably Poland. Uh, there's a tremendous demand for that particular device, and it's driven by the economics and what people can afford. Central and South America, you tend to see older devices still being very popular there because some of those countries, people don't make a whole lot of money. The carriers let people do BYOD rather than selling devices so that they can acquire what they want and activate it on their networks. So, but there's the, the other side is the consumer side where you have platforms, um, back market, Rebello, bstock.com and, and others, uh, Amazon and eBay, of course, where you can go online and buy certified pre-owned devices that have been tested, wiped, graded, sometimes have third-party device protection programs on them to ensure them uh, against being lost, sto stolen, or broken beyond economical repair. So those warranties are actually better than what the OEMs provided originally. So there, there are places like that where people can buy those devices for themselves or their family members. Mm -hmm. Who should attend um, <clears throat> Mobile Disrupt as a uh, interested party, uh, a wholesaler, a dealer? Who who <clears throat> who do you try to attract to come to the show? Well, we're 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 trying to attract the wholesalers that acquire large quantities of devices and sell them, the repair and refurbishing companies, the kitting, boxing, and packaging companies um, that support that part of the industry, the diagnostic and erasure companies that provide diagnostic testing and erasure of the devices. Um, also, some of the companies that provide managed mobility solutions that are starting to look at used devices as a cost-effective alternative for their enterprise clients. Um, some people that are in the IT asset disposition business that want to learn more about mobile. So, you know, anybody who plays in that broader ecosphere is, is someone who's a good candidate for the show. Okay, good. All right, so uh, let's tell the audience uh, when the show is, where it is. You said the Bellagio. How do I register? Uh, all that good uh, stuff. Well, the show dates are June 18th and 19th. It's being held at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. You can register simply by going to mobiledisrupt.com, clicking on register, uh, and then follow the prompts from there uh, to purchase a ticket or look at exhibiting, sponsoring, whatever whatever your interest may be, uh, branding, sponsorships, things of that nature. Good. And that information is appearing on the screen now. Uh, so terrific. Well, Bob, I will be attending this year. It'll be my first uh, time uh, out to your show. I don't get to Las Vegas quite enough anymore, as they say, but at least it's not in August uh, when, when some of the other shows come up. So, Bob, uh, it's a pleasure catching up with you. And uh, you're involved in some areas now that uh, – are really on a, a trajectory of, of growth and specifically for uh, the reasons for our broadcast, uh, the used phone market, uh, call it what you will, many monikers for it. But uh, it's something that I think that has, uh, has taken hold and um, is become more, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's more of a legitimate business now um, that, that it has become so important to the ecosystem of, uh, handsets that you've just described. Do you see it slowing down? Do you see it continuing to just explode? The fact that all these uh, previously owned, that these previously owned phones are now part of our everyday life. Well, it's actually a thirty billion, not million, but thirty billion dollar global industry. Wow. It's the fastest growing aspect of the entire wireless industry worldwide. There's nothing outgrowing that right now. Not new handset sales, not new subscribers, nothing. It's the fastest growing segment. I don't see it slowing down a bit. The one thing that does need to happen, it's been around for about 25 years now, so the space has matured. There's more demand than there is product available. So what basically needs to happen is there needs to be some consolidation in the space. Um, there's some great companies out there, but there's some companies who are honestly weeds in the garden and they need to, they need to go away because they're not bringing any unique value to the space. So that needed consolidation is starting to happen and needs to continue to happen for the space to really 
blossom and, and achieve its full potential. There are a lot of good companies out there. Uh, Prolog Mobile was one you mentioned earlier and others who are trying to help professionalize the space uh, and, and, and bring the needed resources out there to really make it uh, an added value for consumers and continue to give it longevity. So I'm uh, very optimistic about the future of the, of the secondary device market. Great. And that's backed up by statistics. I read that smartphone uh, shipments uh, only grew at 1%, 2% uh, year over year. So you're seeing less of the new shiny models that the early adopters have to have. You're seeing a slower growth rate than uh, you are on the, uh, the use phone market. Bob, I want to sure. contact you at uh, Capital Growth Partners. How do I do that? Well, um, you can go to our website. It's just capitalgrowthpartners.net. Uh, we have a contact us page. My email address is just blafon, L-A-F-O-N, at capitalgrowthpartners.net. Either way is an easy way to contact well, us. Well, very good. Great. Um, really enjoyed uh, having you on the broadcast today. Always good to see you. And uh, I think our two bobbleheads ran off somewhere. They're probably... Uh, having more fun than we are right now. But anyway, I um, want to thank Bob LaFon from Capital Growth Partners for joining us today. And uh, I will see you in June, if not sooner, out in Las Vegas. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. And I look forward to seeing you in June. Okay, that'll wrap it up uh, for another episode of the Boone of Wireless podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.